Yeah. Okay. I don't. I think that Sarah's not going to join us. Today, yeah. So, yeah. Um. So okay. It is eleven oh one oh two. Uh, we are here on Tuesday, August first, for a regular meeting of the Lake County Board of County Commissioners. Um. Let me turn off cell phones. Okay. And quickly for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Anything that needs to be removed. See if everything seems in order. Um, I don't think anything that I noticed that needed to be removed. Okay. Uh, Tim, Liz, Tracy, anyone? Are we we're in good shape for all the six agenda items? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Then uh, look for a motion to approve the agenda. Sure. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve the agenda. Okay. I'll second. Any discussion? None for me. Thank you. Uh, none for me. I'll call for a vote. Okay. Aye. Aye. Uh, the agenda is approved. Um, I do not have any community information items. I don't at this time either. Okay. Uh, oh, and as we said, sort of before we started, uh, Commissioner Mudge is home with one, if not two, sick kids. Um, but we do have forum. Um, I don't know. Yeah, she's not on the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, we have public comments, but there is no one in the room and no one on Zoom, right? No, um, I think it's only clear. Okay. So I don't not only Claire, but <laughs> yeah. only staff. Only staff. Uh, not public. Yeah. Um, okay, so no public comment. Um, and we can come if people, people show for specific agenda items, we can certainly take public comment at that appropriate moment. Okay, so then we launch into new business. Uh, item number one discussion and consideration of liquor license renewable, renewal, not renewable. <laughs> Um, massive golf course. So this took a roundabout track to get to us because they had sent it to the state first. So the state does have their check. Um, and then if they had sent it back to us for proper approval. Okay. So it's just the typical renewal. I don't think there's any issues. I haven't seen any negative comments or anything. So. Okay, great. Is the first step of the process to your office yes. and then to the state? Yeah, local okay. licensing authority always first, and then once you approve it, then it goes to the state. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can just look for a motion. Right. Sure. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve the liquor license renewal for Mount Massive Golf Course. Okay, yeah, I'll second. Any okay. further discussion? No, none for me. None for me. I'll look for a vote. Aye. Aye. Uh, the legal license renewal is approved. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. I have a lot of things to be assigned, so we'll wait until the end of the meeting. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Tracy. We look forward to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, on to item number two, consideration of software purchase, the SPSS statistics for the assessor's office for $1,500. Sure. Um, as you know, the interim assessor is busy 
is the assessing. Um, so I, I can leave this one for you. Uh, so this is an unbudgeted unbudgeted expense for the assessor's office. So in line with our procurement policy, it needs the VOCC approval. SPS, SPSS is a, um, is a stats software um, utilized by assessor's offices. This is something that the interim assessor had asked for so he can uh, continue doing his good work. Okay. I don't, uh, and the assessor's yeah. budget has, has room in, in it. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, look for a motion to approve the software purchase of SBSS statistics for the assessor's office in the amount of $1,500. So moved. I'll second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? No, none for me. Thank yeah, you. None for me. Call for a vote. Aye. Aye. Uh, purchase is approved. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Get to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, item number three, discussion and consideration of the airport entitlement transfer to Ray Municipal Airport. So sure. y'all are flying through this because I told Josh, which is perfect because it's an airport. <laughs> uh, but I told him 11.15, but I think Kayla um, has the knowledge to talk about this item. Sure. Um, so the, the airport entitlement transfer is something that um, we partner with other uh, Colorado airports uh, to receive a revolving grant from the FAA for airport improvements. And so typically what happens is the grant in itself um, is usually too small for us to make any significant improvements on um, our airport with only those dollars allocated to us each year. So with this partnership, we're able to combine those grant dollars and transfer them to um, airports on a rolling basis. Gotcha. So yeah. by the time that money comes to us, um, the bucket of funding is much larger and allows us to leverage that funding um, for bigger projects like our taxi lane. So we just need to uh, consider transferring this money to the Ray Air Municipal Airport, um, and then they'll be able to utilize that funding for one of their bigger projects. Okay, and then sort of on a rolling basis every three or four years, we're the ones in line yep. to get that done. Cool. Yep. Thank you. That makes sense. Yep. So uh, I will make a motion that we approve the airport entitlement transfer to Ray Municipal Airport. Uh, I will second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? None for me, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. None for me. I'll call for a vote. Aye. Aye. Uh, that entitlement transfer is approved. Cool. Uh, item number four, discussion and consideration of 2024 budget guidelines. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, so in your packet is a memo that um, yes um, that with your approval today um, I would like to um, be able to send out to the leadership team and other electeds on uh, how the budget process will work for the remainder of 2023. But this also um, sets us up for. You know, this will be our um, budget process for, you know, just the, the, the general outline and the dates will be filled in. But for every budget year, this will be um, the key milestones that we do every year um, as we develop the budget and our long range financial plans. Uh, so as we talked about last week, um, there are four, you know, kind of major open projects right now that is not saying there are other priorities throughout each department um, or um, you know other areas that the county is working on but major ones that commit a lot of uh, time resources and funding resources revolve around the Justice Center economic development housing and our asset management plan um, and as we work through these more and more um, our policy advisor is working on a general fund long-range plan so that you can see for like the next agenda item, uh, you know, when we talk about increases in the next budget year that how we can, those are accounted for in the general fund long range so that if there is um, a recession or an economic downturn or other things we can plan ahead and so we can understand what we can and can't afford 
um, in the future, as, as we've seen in the past when we play with those variables of what our budget looks like. So uh, you thank you for you guys had approved the uh, financial policies and you know big part of that is understanding that there's a lot of things that impact Lake County government uh, outside of Lake County and you know staff is aware of that as well you know whether it's our regional economy um, national economy and then um, you know the impact the impact of our neighboring communities, how they impact us, but then also, you know, there are international things as well that um, do impact the programs and services that Lake County government provides. So we're continuing to build on the success from the 2023 budget process um, and, you know, continue building up from there. Uh, so we have a, a strong structure in place um, for creating a more robust, transparent, and accountable budget for the BOCC's vision and to meet uh, community needs and wants. <clears throat> so in the financial management system, um, you know, there's two different ways to look at it. You can look at it as the bullet points or as the little circle, right? So we develop our policies, they inform our long range plans, which informs our budget, which uh, goes back to me and then the leadership team on management. And reporting out when we evaluate everything and it's just you know a cycle that we continue to continue to work on um and um have a strong uh, have strong financial management at lake county government so we had identified the bocc's current issues previously in the strategic planning process so the um, model that we have adopted and we're using is the patterson strata model so we've focus a lot on our perspective and we're you know we're really more like in the planning phase right now there is um, more steps and pieces that will come together that you'll see in the remainder of this memo on uh, timelines and how the strata process ties into our budgeting process and they both complement each other um, and meet the meet the needs of the BOCC so um, as we talked about last year, as working on our budget process is um, really breaking apart our budget and you know where revenues come from. So there are obviously the two big ones with property and sales taxes, but there are departments that do, do charge uh, fees for the cost of services and for other things. There are some there are some rates that the BOCC does control um, or has influence over. So landfill rates. Uh, community planning and development, the airport, for example, there are some other, um, you know, uh, other rates that we, you know, we don't have control over that are either set by the state or are so minimal that, um, you know, it's, it's, they can, they're fine staying where they're at, like the, some of the assessor's office fees and, and mm -hmm. things like that, um, that are utilized so, so lowly. The guidance that I have given to the leadership team is that your 24 budget request should not exceed your 2023 budget. Um, so this is an ex not an exercise in futility, but an exercise to see where department directors will step up and meet the needs of the BOCC's vision and their plan on a page and strat up, um, but also you know be able to have more analysis in their budgets. We've discussed a lot um, with the leadership team that. You know, while it's not, um, as we look on, um, you know, if we look at like GFOA and GAP and things like that, right, we don't want people to be over budget, but if you're 5% over budget, that's much better than being 20% under budget because that 20% could have been allocated to other needs for the community. Um, so we're working on a tighter budget management and how, how folks um, spend the money that has been appropriated to them by the BOCC. Can I ask a question on that mm -hmm. point number two, or, or, or do you want to? No, I, yeah, it, I know because there's something caught my eye. I, I appreciate that discipline of <laughs> starting there, but um, I think one thing is, I mean, there's some departments that, like pros, is in an expansion phase. Right. So how how to how I guess one question is like how do you, or or I mean I think quite with some other departments as well like. Um, CPD also has, you know, needed to ramp up capacity. Um, so that's one. And then also, like, where, I mean, where can a department sort of be like, okay, like, we're going to do what you ask them to, but man, we really would like 
a new compactor or I mean where how do we ask for either wish list things or good good new ideas sure. or, 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 or or thing you know or one time uh, you know like 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 life's not that simple <laughs> right no, life is not that simple and, and neither is the budget or the year that is ahead of us and who knows what will happen yeah um, so the first part of your question is kind of back to the strat up model on as we get to the evaluation stage is actually evaluating each department and how they're meeting the BOCC's vision yeah um, but also are they at the correct staffing levels um, yeah reviewing vacancies and understanding where departments are at which will then lead into right so as departments as, as pros you know grows and the BOCC has set those guidelines for the growth in that department to meet community needs is um, understanding their core operating budget so when, I, when I'm thinking of this of like your 2023 budget is your core operating budget like how much will it cost for you to to deliver the services you're delivering now um, hopefully better next year but to the public um, how are you delivering those now? Yeah. And then as we get through the budget, as we continue through the budget process, which you'll see further down, we're going to do what we did last year with the supplemental requests. So okay. if you do need, if you do need the new compactor, if you do need, you know, a shed for the tool library, you do need these things that are outside of your core operating budget that you can think of them as either one-time expenses or addressing deferred maintenance or things like that that yeah. will come through the supplemental budget okay. process. So the BOCC has um, an effective way to weigh in on that. Yeah. So, you know, we have the asset management plan. We've been talking about all these things, um, you know, and to quote one of the, the department directors, you know, is, um, you know, I just, I just want to be on the list. I understand I might be 10th on the list, but I just want to be on the list. So um, having that prioritization with the BOCC and the touch points for the budget of, of how departments are meeting your needs um, and then and, and going from there so you can allocate the funding accordingly. Okay. Yeah, I think I just want to, and I feel like we're sort of somewhat emerging from that culture of like scarcity and like, right. you know, no, I can't be innovative. And I hate to like have someone read this and be like, oh, you know, so I so now yeah. I so now yeah. I can't ask for the cool thing, right? You know, I you know I, I so again I I, I don't I definitely don't want to throw out that discipline, but I want to give people the ability to at least ask for something reasonable. Like yeah. I, and yes, everything you said, like knowing you're on the list of things to be considered. <laughs> <laughs> and and part two right is you know saying that the 24 budget should not exceed your 23 budget is um in a way forcing innovation on department directors if you can't reduce your supplies and services or give up an fte and still yeah. maintain uh the service levels to the public while either meeting the bocc's visions and the community's needs and wants um or you know being able to play within your own budget of like you know what i don't need professional services in x amount of dollars like this could really go yeah. and this this uh this need more yeah does that make does that mm -hmm. make sense yeah yeah um so we like we're working on you know the first step of management is planning so we are um, working on a calendar for the remainder of 2023, which you'll see the dates here in a moment, but then also 2024 dates and just quarterly plans for how everything is done going forward. Um, so also part of that is right, everything is coming to me for review. Um, and then uh, prior to coming to the BOCC, so department directors and I can have, you know, conversations on meeting the BOCC's vision and the, and the, the community needs and wants, and then, um, so department directors are more prepared when they do present to the BOCC. Um, so in Exhibit A, we have um, the budget and the long range plan uh, updates for uh, for the remainder of 2023. Um, as you are aware, so in July, middle of the year, middle of the fiscal year, starting with our budget updates. So the year to date. Uh, budget updates and projections of where they'll be at at the end of 2023. And then um, from there, right, that'll kind of be the first, uh, the second time 
going forward. But will be will be the first time the BOCC is going to see the 2024 budget, which you did see in in folks' budget presentations, and then also updates to the long range plan. So as everybody works on their 2024 budget, that also feeds into the general fund long range plan. So you can see the impact to the general fund over the next three out years. So last week we had discussed on the 2024 budget guidelines. We didn't really talk a whole lot about the strategy. That's kind of more what we're doing today. Um, but you know, just talking about those four big projects that we have acknowledged, Justice Center, Housing, Asset Management Plan, and Economic Development. Again, that's not, those aren't the only things we're working on, but those are the big four that take a lot of resources. Um, we're already past July 31st, but hopefully um, after today, um, you know, and the feedback from the BOCC today, I can send this out to uh, departments. So starting next week, um, I'll be working with um, Ali and um, finance and operations on kind of the fixed costs or things that are kind of out, well, not outside of the BOCC's control, but so we'll be presenting, yeah. you know, uh, various COLA factors to you, which is also in the next memo where you can provide guidance to me, uh, reviewing like inflation where we're at this year so that if we held everything constant for the 2023 budget, your 24 budget would increase by X percent no matter what due to inflation. Um, trying to get the insurance costs from CTSI for both our healthcare and um, and property and casualty, and then also right like all of our other fixed costs, uh, looking at utilities and things like that, trying to identifying those expenses that we're not fully in control of, so we can budget those. By August 24th, uh, the 24 department budgets will be due to the finance office. And then um, also that week, uh, reviewing the rate structure and then revenue budgets um, with me uh, in the finance office and seeing where they're at. <clears throat> so I continue to review those. So as we discussed last year, and we have it in our budget, the 2023 budget book, uh, following GFOA principles, just breaking out um, our local government into those agencies. Uh, so general government, it's called a calm down, but we're, we're using all of our titles, but general government, CPD, public works, public safety, you know, parks, rec, and open space, which rolls up into uh, culture and then human services and public health. So the recreation, you know, will include uh, library, you know, things like that in that. So those will be, those will be the reviews that I'll be doing. Um, general government, you know, includes all the elected offices and then the core, the core services um, that we provide to all departments, so HR, IT, finance, those kind of, um, manager, attorney, uh, those budgets. And then we get to the BOCC review. So in keeping with the categories and following GFOA principles, um, we're going to break out the budget this year so the BOCC can see the overall personnel, supplies and services, asset management plan, uh, capital improvement projects, and economic development. And then later in October, um, we are going, you know, the, the BOCC will review all of the the budget department. So you'll get the big picture and then you'll go down to department by department. So you can see what like overall 2024 personal and supplies and services will look like, the impact on the general fund long range plan, and then later in October, um, focusing on um, department uh, individual budget. Okay. And then in this here is to note um, as we work through these, so I'm saying like, so for the the BOCC approving personnel, supplies and services, asset management, equipment and facilities. Um, so by October 13th, right, my statute, well, it's October 15th, but it falls on the weekend, so we have to go before uh, this date. But on October 13th, we'll open the budget to the public, which does not mean we're just opening the budget, what we have now, everything we've worked on to the public for public comment. As we make changes, as the BOCC approves approves things or provides feedback, we will provide those live updates to the documents online and the ones available in the clerk's office, so that when the if the public does want to make comment on anything, they can make comment you know through October and November, and then by December you know by December fifteenth the the budget will be ready for adoption. 
hopefully in November, the BOCC will be at a point where you can tacitly approve the budget. And then as we wait for the certification of the mills and all of those kind of things, uh, it won't be a seven hour budget hearing in December. Um, yeah, any questions kind of on the budget process going forward? And then um, we're working on the 2024 uh, calendar right now, which will also include like quarterly updates. So it will also include like the things that will be done each quarter in terms of budget and then each quarter in terms of our strat up. So everybody knows what is coming. Um, that we get into these routines of planning and evaluation. Okay. I had a couple questions. Um, sorry to uh, for for um, for projects that are sort of like new and maybe being initiated by one or more commissioners that don't currently like sit comfortably in a department budget like like water or you know local transit doesn't like yet i don't think hasn't yet yeah. really been no, transitioned it a, into a, a department place. home how would you like the bocc like i mean because i think i think that there, there's quite, quite a few projects like that where one or more commissioners is almost in like a quasi staff department role how would you like us to see either things that we like 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 local transit is happening but, right but but there are also probably some like new things we might want to throw out there to to see if it fits and mm -hmm. if there's support how would you like us yeah. to get that in to your brain um yes if you're not <laughs> it's already there um i think as you know, as we but you haven't seen the price tag yet. <laughs> I know. Some of them I have. Um, so you know, I know I know Michael on Michael and I have had discussions about uh, fleet management, local transit, like what that would look like at Public Works. Some of these, some of these, right, like make sense to live yeah. somewhere. Uh, so I think as in later October, as the BOCC is reviewing kind of the department budgets. Um, and that and as we're looking through agency is when we're reviewing as we're reviewing those agency budgets is kind of putting together those puzzle pieces of where things would fit because we do have we do have some price tags of where things will look we do have the bocc's vision of what they do want um but as also so keep in mind as you're you know proving the overall like personnel right well we can have factors for you of like okay if you approve five new fte uh, let's you know get in a given salary range um no, what does that look like yeah um or what is the bocc's comfort level in expanding our fte count uh, yeah. to meet these needs um i was discussing you know um if some of these are should remain as professional services that the county should contract out or does it make more sense to uh, uh to bring it in-house and have it done there yeah um so really, at any time you would like, you can provide me that feedback. But I think as we're as we're in uh, September and then later in October, those will be the times because I think that'll give us the firming up because we have the CDOT contract for local transit. We have I got the CDOT contract this morning for the M or for the, uh, the what do you call it traffic calming the MMOF MMOF bond. So yeah. I have that you know, this morning of like, what does that look like? Okay. Where does that, where does that yep. contract management live? Uh, and then, you know, as we think through, um, you know, other things, uh, environmental or climate and resiliency issues uh, or projects, like is that as, as Janine and the uh, public health team works through their budget and their process and like an expanded environmental health team, like what does that look like? How can we leverage funding for that? Um, so, so we have options. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was one thing on my brain is like, you know, and, and maybe we try to find like a BOCC work session to talk through like what, what it even means, but like whether we do need to find some more in house capacity to deal with all the energy, climate, sustainability 
you know, state state policies that are coming down the pike, and then all the state and federal funding opportunities. Um, I, I think that's a nice to have, <laughs> but it would be nice to have. So we should like think about where it would sit if it can fit in the budget. Yeah, and and whether we all agree mm -hmm. on what its scope would be. Yeah. Okay. So. So any commissioner with a wish list should start working on that almost on these same time frames. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to put something on the calendar that you know gives them a specific date? So we. I think that would be helpful. Think, yeah. And then I I think too it would be help good. Um, August twenty first. Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds fine. Good. Yeah. Great. So we've got three weeks. Yeah. Three weeks to. Get our act together if we care about something. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I think related. I mean, the we've been talking about the justice center decision, like sort of our three pathways that we're analyzing. Just want to make sure. I mean, that has such a big budget implication if we do anything. Mm -hmm. if, I mean, if we greenlight any of those three potential paths, I just think it might be good. Like, I don't quite know where it sits. If it's like part of a Asset management plan. I think there's a specific date for capital and stuff. Okay. Yeah, there is. Um, in uh, so October nineteenth. So hopefully that will tie in when we get the pricing back from FCI, the contractors, if yeah, the, um, for the new Justice Center, and then also around that time we should have um, pricing ideas guidance back from GSG architects who are doing the uh, master plan of this facility. Uh, they will be on site the 16th um, and we'll be meeting you know, with, the, with the board, all electeds and department heads who are in this facility. Uh, Liz and Katie Drops are from um, Dynamic, Dynamic Program Management are booking those. Okay, great. Um, you know, then of course with the sheriff and discussing needs there, and then of course with the fifth, fifth judicial to fifth judicial district as well. Um, so also, so as you you can think of this as well, right? So we can have um, variables for that in October, right? So we can have the variable of a new justice center, a variable of, of this facility and renovation and expansion or or whatnot, whatever the board wants, yeah. wants to go down. We can have we'll have more we can have more firm numbers. Uh, Josh is working on a, a RFP, maybe an RFQ for what it would look like uh, for expansion, uh, utility expansion out to the airport, and then partnering with Ann on like what a development uh, RFQ would look like out there as well for the board to consider to release uh, and the dollars associated with that. The nice thing is is that well as we and by then but before then we will have like a firmed up. Um, general fund long range plan so you can see the impact of these big things mm -hmm. on the general fund. We're also going to hold um, you know, some work sessions and then get to a regular meeting on where the BOCC wants to be at in terms of operating reserves. Okay. How far down do you want the general fund to go? Um, at, you know, and then we're also investment policies. So we have some other financial tools, um, management tools coming your way. But we can we can plug in all those factors right into our into our models and see what a two million dollar COP payment looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, we can plug in what you know yeah. any of these things. Right. If it is a one time three million dollar expense, we can plug all those in. So you'll know um, by twenty twenty eight what does that look like? What does twenty twenty eight's budget look like? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. That was good for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then in Exhibit B, as we talk about our um, strat up uh, and tying into our comprehensive plan, um, well, not comp plan in terms of land use, but like the comprehensive plan for Lake County government uh, to meet the BOCC's vision. So we've, we've been off a little off kilter on doing our regular updates or the scrubs as they are called. So big picture. Um, the scrubs are done four times a year, which will tie into the quarterly updates that the BOCC sees in terms of budget. Um, so you can see both things at once. <clears throat> so going forward, this is the schedule that we would like to stick to. So the last week 
of a quarter, um, you will do a scrub essentially for the next quarter to develop the action initiative profiles for the next quarter of where the BOCC would like to see uh, work uh, either new initiatives or um, increased focus on a certain initiative, if you will. So in 2023, we should have done, uh, we should have done the um, last update of the last week of June. We didn't, we will uh, do it. Uh, we'll finish the AIPs today. And then our fourth quarter scrub will be held in the last week of September. So we currently have that scheduled for Thursday, September 28th, um, doing that scrub. We have the 2024 schedule built out uh, with our recommended dates there on when that will work. And then we also have our department scrubs and action initiative plans schedule built out as well. Uh, we're working on adding more departments in, but currently public works, human services, and community planning and development <clears throat> have developed plan on the pages and AIPs that um, they've pulled their AIPs on focus areas from the BOCC's plan on a page. So for the department scrubs, the departments will do theirs once a year, or twice a year. They're going to do it mid-year, um, then you know towards the end of the year. So you can think of that as twice a year or once a year. Um, so for these ones, you see the schedule there, a recommended schedule. Um, so you know they do their scrub, you know, four weeks. So it's a long lead time prior to the BOCC scrub. Um, and then we go into the BOCC and then the departments present to the BOCC. And then we and then we get to the two weeks before and then we get to, um, you know, my involvement uh, before developing AIPs with the department directors before the BOCC scrub. And then we can do um, we will do the BOCC scrub and the department scrubs. Um, And not in tandem, but close enough so that the BOCC scrub a new action initiative, action initiatives will inform the department's um, plans on a page and updates to that. So these are these are right now they are currently we there are some question marks on there. We do have like tentative dates and setups, um, but if this seems fine with the board, then we will move forward with this schedule and then we will have the rest of 2023 booked out. Sure. Um, and then we'll have then we will work on 2024 and having all of that booked out. Sure. Okay. So we're on a regular, a regular quarterly schedule okay. for both uh, the strat up and financial management. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. And then any, you know, I know any feedback on uh, the memo and things like that are you know, more than welcome. I would like to send this out to CLT today. Okay. Um, or at the very least this week. Okay. Um, I don't know that I have any necessarily explicit um, question. Do you have anything explicitly? To no, ask? I mean, the, no. This makes sense. I think just that point I said at the beginning, I just want to make sure that like bullet number two doesn't sort of like make people give up on interesting innovations. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Good feedback. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, this looks great just to have. I mean, deadlines and a process are great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Um, and then I think just it looks like. Um, there is a place where those budgets come to the BOCC and then we have an opportunity to ask questions of departments. Oh, yeah. yep. and, okay. And then I would imagine that that would be the time that we would take a department's budget and then say like yes or no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cause I did, we, we switched it. We obviously we <coughs> built upon last year's budget process, but I did want to give you guys the the full picture. Okay. So that overall personnel, supplies, and services, all of that of like this is Lake County's core operating budgets or categories, right? So this is how much we're looking at, and yeah. then if you guys have that bigger picture, and then you can see where each department feeds into it. Okay. 
Cool. No, I don't. I don't have any explicit questions or anything like that. I think it's great. Um, and another piece that I I didn't add to the memo, but I will actually. Um, so we will work on having a manager report. I I think on a monthly cadence to the BOCC, either on your first or second meeting of the month. And then departments will write the department reports that you have been seeing. The departments will write a quarterly department report. So, like, for example, Janine's department, right? Like, caseload doesn't change a lot from month to month, but you can see either a trend or better data over a quarter. Okay. So, you'll be seeing the quarterly department updates um, and then a monthly manager update. Okay. Cool. Um, so do you need like formal <laughs> um, approval from us to to give that out to departments or what what is the request of, of us to get this sent out to CLT today? Yeah, it's like we, I mean, we've had the discussion. Yeah. I think we I mean, you can I, I feel like you can just take the sense of the board discussion. Yeah. And the feedback we've given and, and release it. I don't think we need to no, approve no. Yeah. your memo to staff. Yeah. No, I, I think because we're not uh, making any actual budget decisions or any. Uh, yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. I, guess I just wanted your. I guess it didn't need. I guess it didn't need like a formal vote. I just I wanted yeah. your words. Sure. Sure. No, I I, like, this I is where we're going. Yeah, yeah. I, and I appreciate the the dates and what's happening behind the scenes on the dates, and so um, definitely appreciate that. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then. Uh, this is just my final uh, question for for our um, projects that we're working on to present something to you also by that August 21st timeline. Will you give us the same format that you want that in that you're yep. expecting of CLT? Yep. So that there's consistency in, in, in that process and that packet and communication? Yep. Okay. Ah! That would be great. So I think that's good for agenda item four. Okay. Um, so I think we can move to five on the COLA, another, yeah, COLA inflation, nonprofit contributions, move to that. Omo? Sure. <clears throat> um, so in this one, yeah, I'm looking more for guidance on this if we're trending in the right direction um, or if this, is, if this is comfortable for the BOCC. <clears throat> so staff is, um, recommending a merit-based pool uh, for staff. Um, I need some guidelines for county contributions to local nonprofits, uh, input on COLA, um, and then just where we're at on inflation. Uh, so following, you know, our looking at our financial management uh, or financial policies, right? Um, reviewing our expenditure policies and long range plans. So um, you're just telling you where all of this is coming from, where that is in the memo. Um, again, kind of a reiteration of the um, of the timeline that we talked about. And then our recommendations. So in working with Ali, um, I think you know we are comfortable. We're comfortable in making the recommendation to the BOCC to consider a 4% cost of living pool for cost of living adjustment, um, which would right now would be around $400,000. And that you know doesn't include insurance increases uh, or changes there or any of those kind of things. Um, keeping the merit raise pool of 200,000, um, which would be able to provide folks to a zero or 4% merit raise, which is you know, an increase currently this year, we're, as we're uh, finalizing performance reviews now, uh, folks are looking at a 3% raise. Um, so making the merit-based pool um, a little more competitive for folks. And then a recommendation for $100,000 uh, for nonprofits um, being distributed. So if you think back in 2023, what was, um, 
granted to nonprofits was $50,000 to the Tabor Opera House uh, renovation fund, and then $50,000 to St. George to the food pantry. Uh, the contribution to Cloud City Conservation Center was changed and done through a contract this year. I'm comfortable with that model uh, moving forward. Um, so I think that's something the, the board should consider if, uh, where you're at on uh, nonprofit contributions, uh, if there should be a fund or, or the, the amount that you're comfortable with. Um, but 100K is what we spent last year. <clears throat> And then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, Tabor and local budget laws, you know, require us to look at inflation and, um, and CPI. So percent change of a little over 8% or the 2022 actuals, I'm sorry, 2022 actuals uh, for the um, Denver Aurora Lakewood area, which is the area we have to use. Um, was a little over 8%. And you'll recall that last year, the BOCC um, gave a, uh, in 2022, 2022 gave a start of the year 3% COLA, and then a mid-year 4 or 5% COLA. Mm -hmm. um, and then a 3% COLA at the beginning of this year. So folks either got an 11% or 10% raise since the beginning of 2022. So I think the board has done a great job on meeting, if not surpassing, um, our, the Denver or Lakewood um, consumer price index. Tim, just a clarifying question. The $400,000 is inclusive of the salary and the FICA Medicare, that's the estimate based on our salary liability. Um, it should be, but I need to double check that. If I, if I pulled 2022 and just did some quick math on it, it, it seems that it does. Okay. But Wait, yeah, I'll give me the number, but I, did, I will double check for you. Okay. It seems like that's the ballpark, but it yeah. could be plus or minus. Yeah. Slightly. Okay. Cool. But that is the cost of living pool. Is that then anticipating an across the board four percent cola, uh, or yeah. is the actual allocation more like? Because at some point, when you had that like extreme inflation, and we were trying to catch up to the people, there were definitely like different. There were Jeez. different cola. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so sorry. So I typo. I shouldn't have had pool there. I should have had adjustment. So okay. Uh, it would okay. be a, it would be a four percent cost of living adjustment across the board. Okay. okay. For each position, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Except for, except for electives, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then you know. As, so governor's office, OSPB, Office of State Planning and Budgeting, and then Ledge Council, Colorado Ledge Council, you know, both um, provide uh, for forecasts. So you can see where um, both are forecasting uh, where we're at uh, from March and June of this year. Um, so it's better, it's, it's still high, but um, it's better than, than uh, what happened in 2020. <coughs> There was, um, sorry, just back up that current issues paragraph and the paragraph number six. What is my brain was getting tight? That sentence, I guess that's a pulling out of our financial policies. What is the purpose? That last sentence, the purpose of these plans will be to allow. So, sorry, I hadn't read that carefully enough before. So, it's out of your financial policies. Yeah, and I think but like, like we we think sorry we think 
the financial needs of these programs on the regional economy? Like, yeah, it was like, the thing I should go back, this should be local economy. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. I mean, so it's just, it looks like a typo. Okay. The wrong. For sure. Um, okay, that, that was it. Okay. I was just, I, and I, I guess, some like weird macroeconomic analysis of like our impact uh, on the yeah. whole mountain economy. It's like, <laughs> let's, not, let's not do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I guess I kind of am reading that to your point, Jeff, um, that that could be confusing on the surface, but is that the, the financial needs of programs on the local economy to coordinate funding with all funds is that, does that talk about our philosophy and revenue calculation? I guess is what that what that's talking about, right? If you change the regional economy to local economy, then it talks about kind of what we're what we're looking at for revenue calculation to be able to coordinate funding with all of our funds, right? Yeah. Okay. Does that make better sense, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Okay. So maybe if we just change that regional piece to local economy and I don't know if you can just maybe there we can be a just minor and up there we'll just fix the financial policies because this is cut and pasted right from now. there yeah okay and the whole so, idea says just recognize that you're part of a larger more complex issues so totally. should you look around at the regional the state and the national economies yeah and then we want to know like based on economic trends what we can expect to be able to to fund or complete project wise. Okay, that totally makes sense then. Okay. Awesome. So these, um, you know, the proposals for <coughs> COLA and merit and nonprofit contributions make sense. You know, I can, we'll continue to work on those, get more robust numbers, or if you want to see other things, if you want to see changes. Um, Please let me know because they're just looking more for guidance today. Okay, sure. No, that's great. Um, yeah, that sounds good. And then I, I'm imagining the recommendation with nonprofit funding. Um, you'll your office will take care of like dispersing out. Like, okay, if you have a request, here's out to submit a request, mm -hmm. and then you'll vet those requests before they come to us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I don't have any further issues. And again, I don't think we, we don't need to make a decision because I mean, these will actually come, I mean, these will lead into the budget and our decision will be the budget. Right. I just didn't want to, yes, be yeah. surprised or like mm -hmm. address feedback now of like, no, we're not yeah. doing this. Um, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, no, but certainly to proceed with budget for me, the, that COLA um, merit and nonprofit does seem like good places to start okay. as we pull the budget together. Okay. So, do you have any other questions or things you need guidance from us on this memo? No, as of right now, um, I am my income. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, that's maybe something that I was just thinking about, like the other memo, and like, you know, there's going to be like lots of meetings and work sessions, and maybe we just need to think for half a second about like formally, like the final BOCC decision is when we approve the whole budget. Yeah. But we might want to just think for a second about like, how do we capture this like like when when does a work session discussion become a decision on some or all of a department's budget yeah that is sort of like semi locked in Stipulated. to the final yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. i just think about like, yeah decisions have to be at a but 
but but I think that's what I was getting at is like if we I mean on that other memo, you know, like okay, on whatever date we're gonna review these four department budgets, that's not I mean I, I, I don't know. Is that a BOCC decision coming out of the end of that meeting? Because the decision decision is the budget as a whole. The right? budget as a whole, but we need we need to be making sure that we're giving like you and departments and everyone clear guidance on sort of like what has been decided with a little d, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you, but you know what I mean? Like conceptual yes. approval you versus formal approval. It's a very interesting <laughs> language. But well, I think Chris. Well, but what, what, what I mean by that is like it, it, it's a decision, but not like a recorded decision, you, you know, but that's been voted on. But like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about public works as budget in the public works, you know, date on the other memo. And, you know, it'll, it'll, be very clear guidance <laughs> to move that forward you know but i just think we want to we just want to make sure that i i will reflect on like earlier budget years before we had a county manager and some budget processes things were extremely swirly on like how and when a department's budget kind of got locked down mm -hmm. and it wasn't clear which staff person or BOCC member was actually writing down, yes, we aren't going to get the compactor this year. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, whatever it was, you know, or, oh, we're going to double the amount for diesel. Like, you know, it, 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 and then we'd come back and be like, oh, wait, what did we say C4's budget was? So I just want to, I think my only point is like, That's let's let's point. try to get like a little more formal on like capturing decision, you know, guidance decisions, you know, at the end of each of those work sessions, other memos. Probably so it's do like, it at the end of supplies and services and personnel. Yeah. yeah. And then do it again when you're doing it by department. And yeah. the idea of the long range plan is to give you guys an idea that if if you include the budget the way it is. You know, you might still have a surplus as yeah. opposed to looking at a budget that says, no, I need to cut 5%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or I need, or what we've talked about is having a creativity and innovation fund that says these are the funds that are going to go to the emerging issues that what's really important. Yeah. And then, okay, did you, you find enough savings to fund that plus the new money? Yeah. And, and I, I, I mean, I don't. Not like it's like a legal opinion from Chris or anything, but maybe we do post these as meetings, not work sessions. If okay. you know, just to be careful on that, or or so that we can like finalize some things if that's helpful. Right. Yeah, I guess um, Chris gives the thumbs up there. I guess that I guess that that would be would be helpful to err on the side of caution there um and so then as soon as we hear like those that supplies and services and and operational line items and, and budgets then we can give just that formal approval that yeah so that and so that there's not question either with tim's office to be like well i think that this is conditionally approved or stipulated or it's an anticipation that it'll be approved yeah. in the final budget um, but I don't, I think that we would do our department directors a disservice if we don't say, yes, we formally approve this, this level of operations for these departments, because then they're, they're not able to look forward for implementing their long-term, their long-range planning, right? Yeah. And I think really it's not, like, for your comfort, Tim, not about, like, changing the process or procedure at this point it's just that semantics of the formalization of the process right yeah yeah um and again like all pending the final budget approval yes but we can lock some things in along the way okay that was it <laughs> for me <laughs> tim what are you what are your feelings on that yeah, no, that's fine. Um, 
if whatever the board is more comfortable with, if it's uh, more comfortable to be in regular meetings, um, and provide guidance or feedback or decisions that way, that's fine. If okay. you want to um, um, have them in work sessions and just provide guidance or say, well, I want this on the next meeting for a decision item, but however. Yeah, well, I think that we keep your dates and I think that we keep um, the schedule that you've outlined. Yeah. We just, instead of like that being just a work session on the supply, like the supplies and services line item, it's just a special meeting on a presentation. Yeah. That. And we can formally say to you, like, yes, we approve of this work, and then you can move on to the next step, not having to worry about if that's still in limbo. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on item five? I don't have anything else, I don't think. I think it all looks really great. Okay. Um, and Tim, Dallas, Liz, you all got what you needed from us mm -hmm. out of five? I think okay. it's really good to have the checkpoints. Yeah. And so we'll add that to this schedule and say, and, and part of this is we want you to see the big picture because mm -hmm. we really want you spending more time on the 2027 budget mm -hmm. because that's how you make substantial difference in the organization is, is you're going to have to look that far out yeah mm -hmm. and so we want to schedule some time there to say okay if you if you do this this year that's what it looks like in 27. yeah totally okay cool Tim, do you feel good about that too? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Then I think we can move to item six and look at the AIPs. Okay. Sure. So Brenna was our team lead on this because she reports to one of us. She doesn't report. She has one of these boards and committees. The uh, BOCC wanted to understand the various boards and committees that um, you appoint, statutory authority, those kind of things. Um, my best count is that you have 18 of such boards. <clears throat> so the scope of the work is to look at the structure and strategy behind these. Um, you know, essentially what's the intent and purpose? Are they still needed? Are they statutorily required? Um, do they have an impact on the community? It's like, you know, all, all of those kind of things. So we have the, the inventory is done. Um, still working on um, the governing documents and charters, if, identifying if there are any. Um, and then, um, you know, the all of those folks will come back to you um, with making a recommendation on that. We're not there yet, but getting closer. Part of it was the resources needed for this. Um, so Brenna did uh, deploy a survey, um, so which required you know the one-on-one -on -one conversations and like you know following up with people, making sure they're paying attention to this and that this is something that the board wants to do and understand. Um, so that's what kind of why the lag is is on for this one. You know, some of them like like the Library Board of Trustees, right? Everything has been updated, uh, approved by the BOCC, that kind of stuff. Um, some are in okay shape, like the Airport Advisory Board. That's fine. Um, others, you know, excuse me, statutory boards, um, Planning Commission, Board of Review, those kind of things, right? Like, okay, we know we need those. Those are kind of easier, but. Some of the other ones, as you know, whether it's tra transitioning, like with the Recreation Advisory Board, um, what is that? Same with like Lacozy, those kind of things. So yeah. those uh, boards are in transition. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this one, as um, alluded to, is still in progress, um, and. We're, we're working on it, we're getting there, but it has been slow going because this one is kind of like not fully blown up people's whirlwinds, but when you're like, hey, where's the charter for the Rec Advisory Board? Oh, it's been around since the 70s? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, what does that look like? Um, so, so those kind of things. Yeah. 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 
I mean, I think the answer, I mean, we don't need to, you don't need to present like the packet of all of them at once to us, right? Because when we took care yeah. of the library, you yeah. took care of the library board one. So I mean, we can, I mean, as they're ready, we can get these. And I think as you guys prepare your annual, annual resolution for 2024, right, you can, oh, yeah. you know, make the decisions of, so all right, like per what the WAC, the Water Advisory Council, do you want it? Do you not want it? Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Um, and then same with like other boards as well, because currently the WAC is uh, inactive. Is it something that's valuable uh, for work going forward? Maybe, uh, but the board needs to weigh in on that. Um, you know, for like the airport advisory board, um, you know, prior to me coming on, you guys had already updated everything and things like that. You have a good team there. Uh, does it need to be worked on any further? Or, you know, or even just understanding, you know, like with the board of review, what is it, why is it required, like how important is it, uh, those kind of things. Um, so, the, so the BFCC has that basic understanding so you can get to that information. Yeah. Um, and then also thinking through like when you appoint people to those boards, like um, having diverse um, folks and experiences and all of that is great on a board, but like with the board of review, if you've never built a house or been a contractor, you might not be the best person for that board. Um, so, so thinking through those things as well, and, and um, which will lead up to how the DOCC appoints folks to all these boards and committees. Yeah. Um, Janine, I'll let you turn this one over here. Tell me when you run. Um, so we have been working on this and are working with a couple of different county departments. I think that will expand over time. But um, as you'll recall from our presentation on the language um, interpreter network, we um, our goal is to improve access, but also to have some policies in place too. So go hand <coughs> for lots of things that we wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, so that's part of this project. Okay. Do you wanna, sorry, I could, no. um, yeah, so we've established language access policy for one department, um, and that was much more involved than we thought it would be because we not only established the policy, we then trained on it with staff, and then we got feedback from staff about what would help them to understand it better and to um, utilize it better. So then we did more training and then we did desk aids um, to help folks understand when do you use language link, when do you request an in-person interpreter, what does that process look like. Um, and then we also developed a quality assurance process um, for any um, interpreting encounter for them to be able to give feedback. Um, and we picked a vendor for interpretation and translation, um, just noting that interpretation is verbal, translation is written. Our policy currently says that all of our translation will be done by our vendor unless it is deemed to be something that is very low risk, like signs or um, simple communications. We identified in every department what are vital documents and therefore either need to, are, are already translated by state or federal government or need to be translated and then what we will do with those situations where um, we have to determine if we need to provide it in Spanish and sometimes that can be done by with an interpreter reading um, the document. And then the goal is to also expand the interpreter network. So just a quick update on that. We have eight interpreters that just finished training last week and are certified interpreters. And just yesterday we got notice that we got the grant from HICPA for the next round of working on the interpreter network. So that will pay for an interpreter network coordinator who um, can now Kind of take it and and take the requests 
take all the training, take all that um, professional development, and um, work with that. We can go on to the next one and we'll see. Yeah, so that interpreter network coordinator um, will be starting up soon. And then um, in addition to the network coordinator, we asked for a sustainability researcher that can help us evaluate what is the best option for the long-term structure of the network. Should it be housed within local government? Should it become a nonprofit? Should it be its own for-profit business? What would be the best model um, going forward? Um, yeah, so they have been through training. Um, we started taking um, internal requests for interpretation and utilizing our offering those opportunities to our internal staff members who are bilingual and sort of doing a little soft launch that way, um, which helped us to refine the process. Um, I should note that we're having really exciting conversation with the Office of Emergency Management about exactly what the interpretation request process will look like in case of a disaster. And it's helped us identify, you know, if we need to have interpreters at an evacuation point or a shelter, what does that look like? Optimally, you have two interpreters because they're going to need to rotate with each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. um, you have a formal request for that. You have a differentiation between your bilingual staff who are doing their jobs in both English and Spanish and folks who are interpreting for another um, person, making sure that our interpreters aren't asked to take on roles within an evacuation point or shelter that would be um, like don't sit down and enroll who like you're, you're serving as the interpreter we're going to make sure that those boundaries are kept what the cost would be for paying those interpreters and then we're going as far as to identify what's the skill set of those interpreters do they have some emergency management training do they have the mental health first aid training um being able to emphasize that we have a trauma-informed debrief process for them and uh, internally sure. that they can be offered the opportunity to be part of our emergency exercises when they include things like this so that they'll have some skill set that comes with this um and uh, i think i can speak for claire i think she's on there but in her research of what is done by by counties there's not really a protocol for how to utilize and access interpretation during emergencies or disasters. Uh, so yeah. we'll be like some of the first to really develop this. And then we'll have an MOU that'll say, OK, how do we identify that there's a need for interpreter? How does it go through our um, forms and our logistics and finance for approval? Um, where do we need them? How many for how long? Um, all of those kinds of things, and then look at what funding resources can be used to um, make sure that those are paid for. And could this be something that down the road we incorporate within OEM's budget? So does OEM also need to have, you know, access to a language link? Um, and also, what does communications look like going out from the EOC? Mm -hmm. So is that a bilingual staff member who can do that? Is that a translation service? Is that, um, you know, what does that need to look like? And then also, how can the EOC have some pre translated messaging um, mm -hmm. that can be just prepared for ahead of time? And what vendor needs to be selected for that? Um, and uh, you might remember, like, best uh, practice protocols around translation is you have it either done by a professional vendor. Or if it's not um, high risk, then you have it done. You could do it internally, but you have a two-person review process so for accuracy. Um, so I think there'll be lots of neat opportunities. And that's just one example of how we're already working with the Office of Emergency Management. We look forward to working like with communications and developing that process out. Um, and of course, working with public health, I think there'll be opportunities to look at how we're utilizing interpreters. Um, the other thing, of course, that's really exciting is that the county has set up the bilingual pay differential. And the next step for that will be an interpreter pay differential. And that's a huge culture change. That's the shift between asking your bilingual staff to step in and interpret 
um, and at least documenting that or utilizing a vendor for that purpose and documenting that with the next level being let's have certified interpreters who are there yeah. for those purposes and get paid you know um, for that whether it's a staff member who we figure out how to do that for them um, so it could look at a number of different it could mean that we have several county interpreters on staff and then they're available for whatever need it could be that this interpreter network is robust enough that requests can go into that network for whatever's needed yeah um and we'll be monitoring that need but one of the things that came up is that we've never really tracked this yeah so um it's helpful to have for a number of different reasons yeah. i think this is great i don't really have any i mean this is just great um the i would say from time to time i get questions or there are side comments from several of our nonprofit partners who and it's clear from the questions and comments that they assume zero of this is happening so i would recommend that we maybe try to package this up and just like unsolicitedly send that out to you know yeah whoever the right people in those organizations might be because again the, the the clear assumption is zero of this is happening right and and that we don't care yeah so I mean, I'll just, I mean so that, we've made it available in a couple of instances clear. um i think the recommendation or request was asked if we had it on our website which we certainly can mm -hmm. the other thing that we're going to do and we have planned is we're going to start doing interpreter network open houses so we're doing it internally first so our interpreters can get to know our staff okay and learn what those relationships are going to look like and the types of interpreting encounters they're going to be asked to go on and so they have a little bit of relationship before maybe they go out yeah um to a home or something like that and then the next step is to invite the nonprofits, probably one at a time to come and learn about the interpreter network okay. and the language yeah. but the policy we've been asked to put out on the website and i think we've decided that's fine to do and we also got a grant um, that we just got notified of yesterday to promote this to the community and to get member feedback from the community on their experience around language access okay. with the department of human services Great. so that we can say hey do you realize you don't have to bring someone with you when you come do you feel comfortable doing that why or why not or you know yeah. what does your access look like and if you were to feel more safe especially around language access um how would you know how would that look so yeah um it is a really exciting project and I, I think one of the things that's really exciting is we just went straight to the community and said here's an opportunity for you to utilize these skills our goal is that it grows mm -hmm. and it really does become an income opportunity for people so that it's not just a service to the yeah. community but it's also an economic yeah. resource you know, yeah. folks yeah. Yeah. um and we're paying for their certifications cmc is doing their uh, certificate in interpretation and we're um, on the um, advisory board of that now and so we can also pay for folks to attend those courses so. yeah. that, I, I just love that i mean and yeah i think we should tell this more and, and and like i mean you mentioned the pay differential you know sort of hr policy we have i think mm -hmm. i'm sure no one knows about that right you know? right um <laughs> right I, think. I i mean i don't know like uh, i'm curious if the paper would be interested in this especially yeah like, sarah grants. and i have talked yeah, a okay. little bit about it and how we could make I think especially once we kind of get it rolling, we get this network yeah. coordinator hired and we can promote it. I mean, that's really the goal is to yeah. promote it um, and to promote the policy and uh, grow it as much as possible. And I'm really excited to look at the funding opportunities and what that structure will look like going forward because we want to make it sustainable yeah. as much as possible, which there's been starts and stops of work like this in other counties, but the yeah. difference is that it's never had like a home foundation that, that we've provided this network. And the state's really excited. I'm hoping they are funding it for grants now and maybe they'll just make it a permanent home somewhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, but that's a great point. I think marketing it could be. Cool. Love it. I don't have any other. I don't have any questions. questions yeah. on that. Okay.
That's good for you guys to know so you know how to answer those questions when people say we're not doing much. Um, yeah, I think we've we've heard that feedback about language access and so it feels good to make progress on that. Definitely. And we have bilingual staff. I mean, we have, just so you know, we have the highest number of paid bilingual staff on our staff of any nonprofit or any other, um, I'll say government or nonprofit because I can't speak for private yeah. industry, yeah, but yeah. for sure we have uh, the highest number of bilingual staff um, who very are very experienced yeah. too. So, um, and they're well connected in the community to the point that even if they don't work for us anymore, people still ask them questions <laughs> about the public assistance unit. Yeah. Um, this is the, the program that we talked about that we talked about funding through TANF. I think we can look at all of the options holistically together, um, but financial assistance. Um, one of the things that we're finding as we're doing casework with homeless families and then branching out into working with adults only households is just sort of that need for where do we fund some of this. So um, the temporary assistance for needy families can support a lot of this work. It is our broadest um, category of funding that can be used for a broad range of things if there's children in the house. Um, and um, the goal is to have one FTE. This has actually been our greatest barrier so far is because our one FTE dedicated to this has been so busy helping our public assistance unit right now with a huge volume of um, applications and casework that they have. Um, I haven't been able to free her up to focus a lot on this, um, but hopefully that can, can change them in the next year. Um, so you all were, um, Progressive enough last <coughs> year to agree to purchase funding from other counties. And um, if that's available this year, I think there could be some good use for this funding. If, so, so we used general fund dollars to purchase TANF dollars, which is like an efficient way. I mean, like good leverage. Yeah. Yeah, the MOE is, yeah. Or, or maybe I said that wrong, but like, yeah, I no, mean, it's, we, that's kind we, of a good way to think about it, yeah. We, we did number two. Yes, <laughs> um, yes, yes. And secured that. I, yes. Can, how does it work? Can can we add, I mean, if, like, if we were like rolling in money, right? Mm -hmm. then, <laughs> no, mm -hmm. I mean, no, no, I mean, more seriously, like, yeah. if, if there was a gap in, financial assistance needs of the community and we had the ability yeah. to fund that gap. Yeah. Could do we can we add county money yeah. to TANF? Can we add county money to our own program that your staff administer? Yeah, you actually can and so can other funders. So nonprofits um, or other foundations or other entities can match grants as yeah. well. And then would it would that expand the scope of those eligible for it them? Could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um well what you could do is you could say, okay, TANA funds takes care of these folks. You could you could designate some money that takes care of folks that that doesn't cover, maybe like okay. um, you know, households with no children or and then it wouldn't be um it could be a you know a different source of um, funding, which I think is sort of what we're talking about doing with some of the housing um, work that has well, been identified. Others. Well, we've also been seeing some uh, at least one example. I think some other examples from other counties, and we've been talking about with the massive increase in property tax bills. Mm -hmm. You know, some counties are talking about running their own property tax payment assistance program, mm -hmm. you know, and I was wondering, like, if, if we were able to do that, which actual staff or department could, could, could administer that, like, has the capacity and ability, um, which is where I was going with that question, because I, 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 like, so, I don't know if it's, like, the treasurer's office where people come in to with their check mm -hmm. you know or if it's you know a department that runs assistance programs you know i so think I, it's, it's all because and the benefit is if we can 
funnel some of that through case management. They can help determine what's the best mm. use of that funding because mm. you have somebody who owns their home, but for some reason they have less than $75,000 in the home and kiddos, then we could help them pay rent, which then frees up those funds maybe for taxes. But if they don't have those qualifications, you, yeah. Right, and I think since, you know, since it potentially would be a county program we you know we, we would set the eligibility yeah. you know and yeah. payment tiers and yeah. all the things right. you know and as with all these programs you need to balance sort of fairness and targeting it right with not administratively too complicated right and that's sort of where we came in with providing that case management and what we mm -hmm. hope to do with um the new grant that we just got is then be able to make a little bit of a recommendation. So it's not just a random, hey, anybody who needs this, but if they're working with a case manager, they can say, hey, this is this is a part of their plan. Yeah. Could we access this resource as a part of this bigger picture yeah. of sustainability? So um, the other thing that I am working on in helping with public health is their CSBG funding. And just the fact that I think we need to sort of have a little more overlap in um, how to access all of those things, um, which, which sometimes people know, but I'm trying to make sure our case managers and our housing navigator and, and folks like that know where everything is and who's eligible and how to. And it could be that you can only get 500 from this source and 500 from this source, but together, you've got a plan to try to um, make it work. And it's really important to funders that there's also some sense of we're not just bailing you out of a situation that you're going to be in again, you know, yeah. in a couple in months. So, months, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it is a little bigger than this too, trying to make sure that we're really getting a picture of everything that's available and who fits what criteria and what those needs are. I think that's really good too. I think it would be it's helpful to have some of those programs housed together and and have that overlap of like, well, you might not qualify for this, but you will qualify mm -hmm. for this. Because um, I like the CSBG stuff. I just don't think that people know it's available. And then yeah. you know, when we heard from the cog about the, the availability and and that kind of thing, like that was yeah. And sometimes we can go back to the funders and say, hey. You have money for this, but what we really need is this, you know, and this is what nobody's funding. Or um, you're making these three hundred dollar amounts available, but we've got people that need, you know, X amount. So, and we do have some good support, you know, between um, Helping Hands and I um, mean, um, there's like three or four sources, you know, between right. Elks and Helping Hands and. Um, so, and I think those folks like to see that we're also utilizing, you know, kind of a big picture. Um, and the other piece that fits into this since this was developed is the um, CPAP picture. So I'm actually going to have the new caseworker focus quite a bit on CPAP as well, even if it's just helping people navigate it and understand it. And know what's available and that way it can also utilize our CCAP funds to help pay for that CCAP navigator's time because we're underspent so far in CCAP. Um, so even if it's just making them aware of it, it's really all those big picture. And this goes to outreach, that the community wants us doing outreach with people. So the first step in all of this process will be to see if they qualify for any other existing programs like SNAP, and that will help with um, getting that word out to folks about SNAP, which we don't seem to have too much trouble with right now. We're being very, very busy. Okay. Cool. Yeah. That's good. Oh, that's the last one. Sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry. No, I must have. Um, awesome. Thank you, Janine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. yeah. Good for you guys yes. to know about it and support it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Um, 
Well, everybody knows what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And so they can't <laughs> say there's nothing available as well. <laughs> yeah. right. It is. Well, and referrals come from everywhere. So, you know, it's just good for everybody to know. And it, it can work for county employees, too. Like, totally. often it's a county employee who needs that help. So, yeah. yeah we're yeah. happy to. Thanks, Janine. All right, the last AAP we'll discuss today is our technology asset management program. Uh, after Greg leaving, Tom has been the team lead on this. Uh, I'm partnering with Claire as well. <clears throat> um, so when I started, we did not have an inventory of any of our tech assets. Um, so now we have, um, you know, uh, Tom and Greg worked hard on creating a uh, inventory of our tech assets and then um, have started the development of a technology replacement uh, cycle and then also like a recycling program for a long time. A lot of our old IT equipment was just stored somewhere or anywhere. So we've now um, utilized the um, electronic <coughs> recycling program that our landfill has and recycled all of that. Oh. Um, and this also will will tie into as we're exploring things with Pro Velocity for was that expensive? Can I ask? I mean, could, could like we I know like we charge the public, but presumably we, that costs us quite a bit too. We did not pay ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean for us to like take it to a third party? Is right. I mean, yeah, well, so like, like, like if we dumped it at the landfill, I mean, not dumped it, yeah. we dumped it at the <laughs> electronic <laughs> recycling yeah. stuff. Presumably, yeah. Yeah. Um, the landfill has to pay the vendor who takes that stuff away. We don't get paid for that stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, Michael, are you still on? Or, sorry. <laughs> yeah, see who did, you, did you hear Jeff's question, Michael? No, I didn't, but I'm still here. <laughs> well, like, so I think the question was, if we took all of our old, outdated, county-owned electronics to the landfill's electronic recycling center, presumably, or I, I'm assuming that wherever that stuff goes costs us money. And I was just curious who well, I, I was curious how much that cost to properly dispose of all that outdated equipment and which department took the hit for that. <laughs> um, pretty much the landfill's paying for it right now. Um, most of the stuff like computers and especially CPUs with, and stuff like that, um, they actually pay us for. <laughs> There's a price, but most of it gets paid for. Um, okay. And they do send us basically a death certificate saying that it was destroyed, whatever it was, so um, all the computers and stuff, they do let us know that everything has been destroyed. It's no longer usable any place. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Yep. Um, so, and this also informs, uh, you know, the emerging discussions we're having with Pro Velocity for like network and IT management, um, switching from PRN to a more local based uh, uh, provider for that. Um, so, between OEM, I believe HR, uh, you know, we have the Salamander. Um, well, it's, uh, Salamander uh, between OEM and HR has uh, paid for the our identification cards right that we get with QR codes on them for emergencies, and then I believe through IT and OEM there's a asset management system so we can have uh, barcodes on all of our equipment going forward so we have a better more robust way to um, to track it. Okay. Uh, Greg and Tom have inventoried all of our county tech, and then. Excuse me, where we stalled now is, you know, just we need to fit, physically tag the asset, assets. Um, and then once we do that, we can work on, um, you know, a life cycle, like replacement schedule, um, so that we know, like the servers, you know, that we replaced this year, right? That was a, uh, that was a surprise last year that we, they were that long out of date and that, and that they needed to be replaced. So now we yeah. can be on a regular schedule um, yeah. for cycling our technology in and out. 
So the main resources you know needed for this were our uh, staff time, and then you know, one for planning what an AMP would be for tech, and then um, looking at uh, or spending time researching on what what could be used. And then you know we landed on Salamander, so that you know did involve some other departments with OEM being involved. Um, but once we get once we get through that and everything is tagged and all of that, then we just we have a cycle and those resources diminish and we just we're we're on a set pattern and we can cruise through things. I know this is really silly, but I know when they came into inventory stuff, like in my closet, there's stuff that they were like, we're not inventorying that. But like I think your overhead projector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Historical society. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but 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 I mean I think like some someone probably needs to like go look in every closet in the county. And yeah. Well and, I, and like they, the they had a of stuff. They have a ton stored in in our office too. Yep. And and they did clean that out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I, I think a lot of the I think a lot of the Well I was going to a new closet. Yeah. Right. I think a lot of stuff that was in there though, like old monitors and old printers and, and things like that, that were pieced together for the pandemic response, like just to make sure people had stuff at home where we weren't quite sure where they came from. Yeah. Like those things have been eliminated because um, they were pretty dated anyway, so. Part of this is, you know, it's breaking the habit of hoarding, hoarding. at Lake County yes. government. Hoarding. It's, it's okay to get rid of things. Yeah, totally. Uh, so yeah um well it was great it was great to like have somebody say to me hey your computer's up for replacement yeah i was like oh really that's right. never happened to me before <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i've been here for a while so, <laughs> well, so it, that was good though yeah and it you know it takes it takes time to implement these policies and these new procedures but also it's just a recognition of it's expensive to be cheap it's expensive for a commissioner to or a department director to sit and wait for 30 minutes for their computer to boot up to fail again to lose your files to do all yeah. of that um there's yep. there's a cost associated with that as well totally aside from frustration yeah <laughs> in in lost productivity yeah yeah, yeah. definitely um so working on uh tagging things and having them in salamanders so it's already you know a service we do um uh you know pay for so driving the efficiency there um so things that are um you know already deployed like all of our laptops and things like that we'll work on um ingesting them into salamander and it, and and <laughs> It's a um, technical term. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Um, Sal yeah, so salamander is still the preferred. I know we've had some struggles with salamander, but yeah, with the well, with with the ID uh, printer, we've had challenges with okay. it. But for everything else, with system. salamander, yeah, okay. everything else in terms of that, it's um, it's working. Okay. It's cool. Yeah, and so we actually have a. Um, we'll have a technology asset management plan. Okay. What a concept. I know. And Yola, hey, it's Claire. Sorry, just to let you know the printer is up and running now. Um, we just got that back from service. So the printer's up and running and it's been working really well lately. Oh, cool. Thanks, Claire. Well, and you want me to take a picture and print an ID badge for your. Equipment. <laughs> really, sometimes. Well, no, well, no, we're not gonna do that. There's, I think Claire is a smaller printer, so we can actually do the tags. So each laptop uh, and monitor has really like cool. an ID code with it, or I, it actually has a a barcode on it, so then you can just yeah. scan it. So Tom can go around scan it. Wow, Kaylee, your computer is really out of date. I'm yeah. gonna need you to work on that. Tax so, and HR. Do you guys know where they're? I'll take those and okay. go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other any other feedback? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, that's good. And that is all I have for you. Okay. Cool. Kayla, are you good to yeah, wrap up number six. Yeah, I don't have okay. any other questions on that.
Okay, awesome. I think we can turn to the consent agenda, which is accounts payable, payroll, and one set of minutes from July 13th. I did look at the July 13th, it's just the one. I did as well. Okay, yeah. and it was good. Yeah, um, so I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Great, I'll second. Okay. Uh, no vote? Aye. Aye. So consent agenda, all items are approved. And I think with that, at 12.40, we can adjourn. Cool. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Um, Thanks, Chris. Check your emails when you get a chance, please. Yeah. Will do. Thank you. Do you need me to hang around for anything? Jeff. I think we're good, Chris. Hey, Chris, Thanks. this is Liz. Actually, Liz might need you. Okay. I just have a comment. Um, so you accepted the invite uh, for stipulation letters. I was just going to go check in with Annie and Mark. I just wanted you to know that. So you don't okay, have well, I just, yeah, I just let, did that to let you know that I was available if you needed me. Cool. I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, bye, folks. Thank bye. you. Yeah. CDPHE gave a go ahead on letter.